you love the Dastardly Decimal System and want more? Our Patreon is the best way to get that. Members will get access to show notes, official artwork, our new bonus episode series called Cleaning Up After Tea Time, and of course, plenty of cat pics of Vega voice actors, Vash and Zid. This can all be found at patreon.com slash dastardly decimal system. Stoke a fire hot enough, and you will never run out of things to burn. Xenagos, the Reveler. Welcome, humble adventurers, to my realm of knowledge and mystery. Here, in my cursed library, are endless tomes and scrolls on the darkest and evilest foes in all the realms. Be they from Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, the many worlds of darkness, or any realm in between. Welcome to the Dastardly Decimal System. I'm your caretaker of the corrupt, the librarian, Caster Kane. Evil gods exist in almost every realm. They are malicious creatures that stare down upon us from above. They are to be feared and not to be toyed with. Yet, in my experience, they are not the most dangerous. Those without remorse, who view the world and its rules as little more than a farce, they are the foes without limits. They are the ones we should truly fear. Grab a seat because the tea is ready. I have brewed Seder tea. It's a blend of black tea, raspberry leaves, and a handful of other berries. It's the type of tea that allows you to revel in its rich flavor and just enjoy it with all of your senses. This will go well as we talk about the Seder known as Xenogos, the god of revels. A satyr is a humanoid of any gender with the legs and hooves of a goat and the torso of a human. They have horns atop their head and are a nimble folk with a charismatic flair. Most satyrs, especially in the land of Theros, believe that the other races suffer from a plague of seriousness. Philosophers had little other point than to be mocked. Warriors were simply there to be teased. And city builders were ripe for ridicule. To a satyr, life was meant to be lived and experienced. It was meant to be enjoyed by all of the senses. Satyrs saw the world and everything in it as a to-do checklist, begging to be completed. Many saw the satyrs as impish, benevolent beings with playful souls who did little but party. In truth, some were mischievous, malevolent hedonists that engaged in violent revelries. Some decadent events went as far as to enslave wayward humans and towards dangerous, hedonistic cults. These satyrs were led by a malicious ruler known as Xenogos, the King Stranger. Xenogos was a male satyr who had brown fur and auburn red hair that seemed to burn with his passion. His body was covered in red markings akin to war paint. He wielded a spear with a lyre-shaped carve just behind the tip. Xenogos, however, was a man devoid of emotions. He did not feel like others did. Where others felt joy, he felt nothing. Where others felt rage, he felt nothing. Where others felt compassion, he felt emptiness. He was incapable of emotions. He knew how to fake an emotion, of course, but not how to truly feel it. This lack of emotion opened his mind. He thought himself an outsider, and he saw the world differently. He saw the world and the gods as a farce. To him, it was all a game, and one he had no interest in playing.
There exists a multiverse of magic, with near infinite numbers of realms that were all built upon the five aspects of mana. Each of these different worlds were referred to as planes. Some planes were technological empires built on magic and science. Others were forest-filled worlds with rampaging kaiju. Some had mechanical ants that traversed the land, while others were entirely made up of one gigantic city. Each world was vastly different from the one beside it, but sadly, there was no way to travel between these worlds. However, there were those blessed with the mystical power known as the Spark. These mystics had the ability to break the rules of the multiverse and travel from plane to plane, visiting new worlds whenever they so chose. They were known as Planeswalkers. Xenagos was a Planeswalker from the Plane of Theros. Theros was a Bronze Age plane that housed myth and monsters. It was a world of three layers. In the middle was the land of the living mortals, where heroes and monsters resided. The lower layer was the underworld, home to all the souls that had passed on. Hovering above was the mystical starry sky known as the Nyx, the heaven home to the gods. In most worlds, the populace stares up at the sky and wonders if the gods are real. In Theros, there is no doubt. The Nyx is a mystical starry sky that connects to the dreams of every soul. It is the realm of the gods. When a deity manifests, it is seen in the skies above. When two gods dance or duel, it is seen in the stars above. And when a god wants its will known, the stars dance and the populace is reached via their dreams. There is no doubt of the gods' existence, because sometimes they even walk among us. They don't rely on faith, because the gods make themselves known. In the history of Theros, the gods were the mighty beings who saved the humans from the vast, world-shattering monsters and titans, and in return, the humans worshipped them and praised them, knowing that without the gods, the humans could not exist. Xenagos, however, operated on a slightly different belief. Xenagos was a soul with little care for life and even less respect for the living. He killed his own twin sister in the womb and was born with stronger magic because of it. As he grew older, these violent acts continued. At the age of six, he murdered another child just to see what it was like. He repeatedly tried to murder Raisa, his own mother. Once by setting her caught on fire while she slept, and in another attempt by striking her with a stick. Each time she survived, Xenagos applauded her strength and tried again. Her tenacity amused him. His violent attitude meant time and time again they were shunned and exiled from the big cities and even the small satyr villages. Satyrs don't normally raise their children in the same manner as humans do. Whereas a human's biological parents would be their primary caregivers, satyrs took a more communal approach. The child would find parentage from whomever best suited them. Raisa, however, defied her people's culture and decided to raise Xenagos herself. She sensed greatness in him and wanted to be a part of that. Yet after numerous attempts on her life, she called out to the gods and asked if she was being punished. Why were such trials being bestowed upon her? Day after day, she looked to the sky and searched for a sign, until she received a vision. She saw her son standing by the gods, 
not before them as a champion or as a pious servant, but instead she saw Xenago standing beside them as an equal. Like the rest of his kind, Xenagos lived the life of a hedonist, reveling in a carefree life of pleasure without inhibitions. He served as the host for many revelries, making events with such bliss and pleasure that humans often found themselves lost for days on end. During one of these events, at the height of pure, decadent pleasure, his spark ignited and he was whisked away to another world. Xenagos discovered he was a planeswalker, and he spent the next decades traveling to new worlds, sampling new, impossible pleasures and creating revelries across the multiverse. This continued until a pair of grim facts took hold in his mind. The first fact? He was meaningless in the multiverse. He was an insignificant soul in a sea of infinite lives. The second? The almighty gods of Theros, whose vast powers ended at the edge of their own plane, were just as meaningless. Following the trauma of this revelation, and disillusioned with the meaningless hedonism, Xenagos returned to Theros and began the steps for a new plan. Now in this multiverse of magic, each plane is held together by the five colors of mana, red, white, green, black, and blue. This mana exists in everything, from a blade of grass, to a human, to a giant, and everything in between. Those who have greater control of the mana become powerful warriors and wizards. Those devoid of morals, however, could manipulate the mana to perform powerful and vile acts. Xenagos was completely devoid of morals. With his new plan in place, he began to use this mana to create frenetic rituals that shave stars from the underpinning of the world, creating a rift between the mortal world and the Nyx. Xenogos returned to Skola Valley and resumed his revelries. With his knowledge and pleasure gained from different worlds, his revels became a thing of legends. People from all across the realm came to the valley to partake. He bestowed upon them great euphoria, and the people worshipped the revels' joy, an emotion that, ironically, he could not feel himself. Now, worship on Theros is more than just a simple act. It is not a meaningless gesture simply thrown around. On that disc-shaped world, worship was a source of magic for the divine creatures. It was a form of power. Now as word of his revels grew, a man named Petros, an oracle to the forge gods, stumbled into his valley. Oracles were unique creatures with ties to the gods themselves. They had the gods' will, thoughts, and even chunks of their knowledge inserted into their mind. From that, they could better serve their god and spread their deity's message. With Petros now at Xenagos' disposal, he created a series of divine forges in the secret tunnels beneath the Skull Valley. Then, he picked at the oracle's mind stealing the secrets to divine creation, a tool he used to create a new breed of minotaurs. The minotaurs of Theros were brutal warriors who admired strength and adored combat. They stood a head taller than most human men and were nearly twice as strong. The breed that Xenagos had made were nearly double in height and strength of that of a regular minotaur. Now around that time, a legendary Hydra had awoken from its slumber. This was Polukranos, 
the world eater. He was known as the herald of terrible times and was feared the world over. Many of the gods themselves even feared the creature. Only one weapon was known to be able to slay the Hydra, the god send, and that weapon currently resided in the hands of another planeswalker, a warrior woman named Elspeth Tyrell. Xenagos crept into the home of Polukranos, the Nisian forest. He approached the beast and told the Hydra of the weapon and the woman that meant to slay her. He incited the Hydra's rage and watched in glee as it rampaged across the land, laying waste wherever it traveled. While the rest of the gods looked towards Polukranos in fear, Nylea, god of nature and the hunt, saw the real threat for what it was. She knew that Xenogos was of greater concern. She accosted the satyr king, but he simply laughed her off. He knew the gods to be a farce, and one in which he was no longer willing to participate. Furious at the destruction that Xenogos had caused, she shot an arrow into his chest. But again, Xenogos did not fear her. He knew the two most important rules that existed for her divine kind. No god could slay another god, and no god could slay a mortal by their own hand. Even as the arrowhead remained lodged in his chest, a sign Xenogos took as his superiority over the goddess, it could not kill him. Furious at his arrogance, Nylea removed her protection on his valley. Trees faded from existence, grass turned brown, and the plants withered. She diverted the stream away with a wall of vines and ordered away all the animals. Even the earthworms fled from the sickly ground. In a matter of minutes, she had turned his valley into a wasteland. Yet as she departed, Nylea still feared the satyr. Somehow, his magic and his revels were beyond her god's sight. As Polukranos caused great devastation across Theros, the gods began to fight amongst themselves. Like the squabbling siblings that they were, they blamed each other. Some, like Nylea, wanted to protect the beast, knowing that its actions were not of its own fault, while others wanted to kill it outright. The gods turned on each other as they fought. The sea god turned the waves violent. The forge god set the ground ablaze. The god of storms assaulted the land with hurricanes, and the god of sun pulled his burning orb from the sky and sent it shooting towards Theros. Rufix, the god of horizon and time, watched in horror as the destruction occurred. Seeing no other option, he enacted the silence. Each god was pulled away from the mortal realm and locked in a distant part of the Nyx. Now, each god was unable to affect the mortal realm. They could not intervene. The storms vanished, the seas went still, the flames burnt out, and the sun returned to its normal place in the sky. The mortals were safe from the godly wrath once more. Yet, as they were being pulled away, Nylea screamed in protest. She knew the truth for what it was. The biggest threat to Theros was not the gods. The biggest threat came from a mortal. It came from Xenagos. The world of Theros is based around three major human cities, the largest and most central of which was Akros. In all of this city's history, their walls had never been breached and the city had never fallen. Xenagos, however, had a plan on how to change that. In the dead of night, Xenagos took several minotaur heads and secretly impaled them on spikes around the city for all to see. Then he went to visit the minotaurs himself. 
He told the clans how the Akros army was using the silence as an opportunity to hunt down and wipe out all Minotaur kind. He offered the enraged armies two crucial aspects. The first was his collection of forge-built Minotaurs to bolster their forces. The second was a foolproof plan to destroy Akros. The Minotaurs attacked, laying siege to the walled city. Using powerful mana, they constructed a wall around the Akros wall and hid in the gap between. From there, they were protected from a flanking army and it prevented any access in or out to the city. Many died at the Minotaur hands, and it looked like Akros was lost for good. Yet at its deepest, darkest moment, when all seemed lost, an opportunity for victory came from an unexpected source, Xenagos himself. The satyr snuck into the city and demanded to speak to Elspeth. Feigning loyalty to her side, he gave her the key to success. Using the massive underground rivers that ran beneath the city, several strong mages used the mana to bring the water to the surface and wash away the majority of the Minotaur army. The city of Akros cheered and decided to celebrate their victory. Each and every soul partied well into the night, basking in the joy of victory and giving praise and thanks to those that kept them safe. This would be forever known as the Great Revel. And this would be the final ingredient of Xenagos' plan. In his many travels across the multiverse, visiting planes far and wide, Xenagos learned of an act called Theogenesis. This was the act of taking people's belief, praise, and worship and converting it into magic and power and even using it to create life. This knowledge revealed to the satyr the ultimate secrets that the gods of Theros were desperate to keep to themselves. The gods of Theros needed the humans in order to continue existing. Without their worship or their praise, they would simply vanish. So when the entirety of Akros were celebrating their victory, and giving praise, they were generating great divine power. And with the silence making the gods out of reach, there was no one to channel that power, except for Xenagos. He absorbed all of that power into himself and passed through his created tear, entering into the Nyx. His arrival made a new constellation in the sky. His power exploded across the world. The great Daida River became a massive snake of fire, and the mountaintops exploded in flame. A ring of blackness appeared in the heavens, like a black crown atop the head of the world. This creeping void expanded until it began to seep into the minds of mortals, forcing the feelings of raw anger and burning violence into their mind. In that moment, the satyr had ascended into the form of a god. All hail Xenagos, the god of revels. Becoming a god and staying as one are two very different things. When he arrived in the heavens, Xenagos discovered that his power was waning. Desperate for more, and to secure his position, Senogo searched the Nyx for the Nyxborn and divine creatures. He trapped each one in a series of magical flame prisons and siphoned their mana into his own. Angels, Archons, Celestials, and even the mystical lions and wolves found themselves trapped and drained, their essence and mana being used to fuel Xenogos' divine pyre. A second threat to his divinity was the wrath of the planeswalker known as Elspeth. During the Great Revel, when every man and woman found their bodies stiff and unresponsive, like the point of the night where tiredness and drunkenness cause a body to lock up, Xenagos came for Elspeth. As a planeswalker himself, he knew the greatness of her power. 
he also wanted the God's End, a weapon he feared and desired all at once. He expected to find her paralyzed like the rest, the result of their mana being drained during the revel, but somehow, Elspeth still found strength to defend herself. Left with no other option, Xenagos assaulted her mind. He filled it with the Phyrexian mechanical horrors from other worlds, the same one Elspeth had fought over and over, the same army she had lost numerous friends to. In her mind, she saw a Phyrexian obliterator descending upon her. Elspeth screamed, grabbed a blade, and stabbed at the obliterator until it stopped moving. As the illusion faded away, Elspeth found the creature gone. Yet, to her horror, the figure that she had stabbed over and over was revealed to be the man she loved. He died in her arms. His last words, as he looked up at Elspeth, was, I forgive you. Bowing revenge, Elspeth sailed to the edge of the Discworld of Theros, where the Nyx in the mortal realm met, and the water of the world fell off into the abyss. There, accompanied by another planeswalker known as Ajani, she entered the Shrine of the Gods, made a deal with the Death God, and crossed into the heavens. Elspeth traveled the constellation heaven until she found the satyr. Xenogos had become a horizon dominating, monumental stature of God. The two instantly began to fight. Elspeth first tried to free the trapped celestials, looking for allies. But with each angel and archon set free, Xenagos's power weakened. Realizing this could turn the battle, she released celestial after celestial until almost all of Xenagos's power was completely gone. After a long and difficult battle, when Elspeth and Ajani found their mana reserves on empty, Xenagoth knocked Elspeth down. He pinned her to the ground, planning on stealing her weapon and adding its power to his own. Desperate and with no other option, Elspeth flung her sword spear towards him. The godsend collided with Nyla's arrowhead, still lodged in his chest. The arrowhead exploded into a million razor-sharp shards inside of his body. His beating heart was instantly and painfully shredded. A river of stars flowed out from his wounds and his body fell apart. Three days after his ascension, Xenagos, the god of revels, was no more. The laws of Theros say that only those who die on the living layer may make the path to the underworld. Those who die in the Nyx simply fade away into nothingness. I, however, have my doubts. Planeswalkers are notoriously hard to kill. The few recorded instances of a planeswalker's death comes at the hand of another planeswalker, or from self-sacrifice. The gods themselves are also notoriously hard to kill. Time and time again, in countless worlds, a dead god never seems to stay that way. They are always reborn or brought back to life. There is some loophole in the laws of God that always allow an evil one to return. For a god as cunning, ruthless, and destructive as Xenogoth, who has the ability to travel to far-off worlds in an instant, I would not be surprised to find him hidden somewhere, planning his revenge. Somewhere, on some distant world, is a party where people are simply enjoying themselves, unaware that the evil satyr, that the gods of revels, is watching, draining little bits of their mana to replenish his own strength. Remember this at your next party. Oh. Well, it seems that our tea has run dry. Join me again in my library for more stories and lore about the darkest villains from the darkest realms. This has been the Dastardly Decimal System, and once again, I am your librarian, Caster Kane. The Dastardly Decimal System can be found on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at DD System Podcast. That's Delta Delta System Podcast. 
We are also now on TikTok. Drop us a message and say hi. Vega always loves the attention. This podcast was produced by Midnight Reading Audio, a division of Midnight Reading Publishing. The voice of Caster Kane is Larry Gent. Hi! The voice of Vega the Cat was provided by my cats, Bash and Zid. Music was Dark City Soft Piano by Merjad Hossein from Pixabay. Thank you, and have a wonderful, wonderful evening.